so th this is chapter one, uh, limits, alternatives, and choices. And what this is, is it serves basically as an introduction to economics. I mean, my presumption is that basically um, you know nothing about economics um, at all. And that's what I'm going to start off with. Um, even if you have taken this course already, obviously I'll presume that you haven't remembered anything at all from that course. And what I do here in this um, lecture is I combine both the actual chapter as well as the appendix. And what I'm, you know, every professor has a different philosophy as well about whether they want to make the video short or long. You know, do I break it up into several parts or do I just do one lecture as a very long lecture? I am choosing to do a very long lecture that you can, in YouTube, you can create bookmarks or you can remember at what time you stopped at it. Um, you know, I guess my philosophy about anything is um, if you don't want to do it, it, there's no great way to do it to make you want to do it. Um, <laughs> and I would imagine that that applies to um, economics lectures as well, that uh, if you don't want to do it, me breaking it up into several small parts is not going to make a difference. So, let's begin. Uh, again, each of these um, these files that I'm working off here, I'm going to post them as PDFs in the bookmarks part of Connect as well as in La Lima. <coughs> so, the title of this chapter is Limits, Alternatives, and Choices. And what this does is it gets at this idea that, um, for the most part, um, you know, one of the key things I think we could talk about here is that in terms of economics, in terms of how we define it, is that it is a science of scarcity. Which essentially means is that um, it's this idea that, um, and I can um, block this so it stops doing that, is that we get to a point where um, that we get to a point where you have a certain number of wants and needs and the question becomes how are you going to meet all of those wants and needs given your scarce resources so if that's the case um, how do we make that decision how do we decide what we're going to use our scarce resources, our limited resources. The fact that the resources themselves are limited. How are we going to use those limited resources to fulfill unlimited wants and needs? How are we going to make that choice? That's all going to come down to what economists do, which means then we're going to look at what the limits are then that we're faced with as we're doing this, what the alternatives are. Whenever we have to make one decision, we could have obviously done something else, and then how we understand the way in which a choice is made for individuals. Now, um, what I'm going to do as well um, when I make these videos is I'm obviously writing on here. I'm actually as well going to, it seems like a good idea at least, um, I'll create a PDF that has um, these writings on it as well just in case this seems a little unclear to you. So, <clears throat> it's <coughs> that economics then really looks at its way in which choices are made then, given that that scarcity condition exists. Now, it's largely a social science. Um, it is in the UH system. It is considered a social science. In other schools, it might be considered more business, um, which I, I've been in both. I've taught economics both within a business school and within a social science department it really doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of how the course is taught. But the basic idea here is that first part. 
is that all of our wants and needs obviously exceed what we have the ability to produce, what we have the resources that can make something with. How do we make that choice? That is what economics is. It is then, I guess on another sense, is is it comes down to then a science of how decisions are made. How are decisions made by you and I as individuals and how do firms make decisions of what they're gonna produce, right? Why is it that if we look at Toyota, they make the Prius and they make a lot of other fuel efficient cars, which differentiates them from Porsche, right? Which makes race cars. How do we understand those two firms as making decisions about how they're gonna allocate their labor, their, product, uh, their uh, production facilities to making certain kinds of cars? Right, just like um, right, Hawaiian Airlines, right, flies a lot between the islands, doesn't fly as much to um, the east coast on the mainland, right, doesn't fly at all to Europe, as opposed to United Airlines, right, which flies around the world. How do we understand those firms making those kinds of decisions? So then, what does it mean then to be <coughs> an economist? What does it mean to think? like an economist. And I'm going to add to this here, not only to think like an economist, but we're particularly looking at what it means to think like a neoclassical economist. Because I'll say from the outset that what this course will not do is it will not look at um, Marxist theories, it will not look at feminist theories, we're not going to look at um, Austrian theories of economics. Any of those that I just listed are all perfectly legitimate types of economists, and some of them are my friends. Um, I just don't happen to be one of those kinds of economists, and in the United States at least, I don't know, 90-95% of all economists are this kind of economist, a neoclassical economist. <laughs> so that's going to be the focus of this course. And what a neoclassical economist then, how we think of them as um, understanding how the decision process is made, is that again, the focus is on scarcity and choices made under scarcity conditions, that the behavior of individuals and of firms is purposeful, or we could say that it's made by a rational, self-interested individual, And that the kind of analysis that is conducted by economists is done on a marginal basis. Or whenever you see the word marginal, you can think of that as additional. Or more purposefully, that I'm thinking of how does doing something one more time compared to the cost, the benefit of doing something one more time compared to the cost of doing something one more time. So let's look at the first of these. <clears throat> Scarcity and choice. Um, it is absolutely the case that resources are scarce. Whether you think of that resource as like oil and timber, or whether you think of it even as time that you have in your day to do something. Right? Um, I'm married, I have a two-year-old at home. I obviously face time constraints that if I were to get very poor right now, getting a second job is not really an option for me because it would mean that like either I'm not going to sleep or I'm not going to spend time with my family. So I'm not going to do that unless I absolutely, absolutely have to. There we go. That's a choice that I've made. Now, what is the cost of that choice? Well, because I've decided not to pick up a second job, maybe I am giving up $300 a week in, in income that I could have earned, right, doing a second job. Well, there's my opportunity cost. Now, the opportunity cost doesn't have to be cash, right, the $300 that I give up. It could mean that it could be something non-monetary. Instead of, I don't know, I sleep like seven hours a night, right? What if I cut that down to five because I want to watch more Netflix? Well, if I want to watch more Netflix, what that's going to mean, right, is that the opportunity cost of watching two more hours of Netflix is going to mean the opportunity cost is two hours less of sleep. 
And it all gets to this idea that there's no such thing as a free lunch, which is a very bad joke when you go out to eat with an economist because they always say this line. But basically what it means is that anytime I do anything, it has a cost. So um, even if I allow people to go see a movie for free, it still costs two hours of their time. And that's pretty valuable. That for each of you, going to Leeward College, um, taking a class at Leeward College is pretty inexpensive, right? Well, inexpensive relatively speaking, right? That it's 600 some dollars. But that's not the biggest cost to taking this class. The biggest cost to taking this class is that you're going to spend anywhere between 50 and 100 hours total on this class, right? Between doing homework and assignments and exams and emails, etc. Well, it's 100 hours less of work, right? Or 100 hours less of sleep. Or 100 hours less of um, Xbox, right? That there's something there that represents the cost to doing one thing rather than another. If you were an economist, you'd want to know what is that opportunity cost to doing something. For point number two of what does it mean to be an economist is that we're talking here about purposeful behavior conducted by both firms as well as by individuals. So by people as well as by firms. <coughs> and the assumption, now it's an assumption, but the assumption is that people act in a self-interested way and they act according to rational principles. Now, why, so then it would be, how could an economist understand um, why do I love my son? Well, I love my son, I mean, I do love my son, right? But if I was an economist, I might try to say something like, well, I don't want to have to save for retirement, so I'm going to really depend on him to help me um, live past my working years, right? And I might then raise him and try to be good to him so that he's good to me later, right? I would certainly be thinking of things in a rational, self-interested way. Eh, it kind of would reduce how we think of love, right? Um, that these individuals then that are making these kinds of decisions, think about things in terms of this concept called utility. When individuals make decisions, what they are trying to do is they're trying to maximize utility. And what utility is, is it's kind of a catch-all phrase that economists use for happiness, but probably more importantly what we use for a feeling of satisfaction. So this is how economists understand how people make decisions, is that they're trying to maximize their satisfaction or their happiness. For firms, it's a little easier, because firms here are presumed to be trying to maximize profit, where profit equals the difference between revenue, the money that a firm brings in, minus their costs. <laughs> and so that things they do should be trying to maximize their profits. So the desired outcome for an individual then is maximized utility, and for a firm it's maximized profit. And the third part to this then is the marginal analysis. And what that means is that whenever I do something, the marginal again standing for um, additional, when I do something one more time, there's a benefit to doing something one more time and a cost to doing something one more time. And when I have to decide, do I do something one more time, I'm then comparing that kind of thing. Now we can certainly think of things, right? So let's say I'm in a desert and I haven't um, drank any water for an incredibly long period of time. The benefit of a single bottle of water would be incredibly great, right? The benefit of drinking a bottle of water in the desert after not having drank a long time would be incredibly great. And the cost would be very, very low. If the, if the bottle 
right, the, the time it would take to drink that bottle or even the price of that bottle, right? Let's say I had to pay a dollar, right, for the bottle of water and it takes me 30 seconds to drink an entire bottle of water. Those costs would be far less than what they would be um, compared to the benefit. Now I'll do it the opposite way. Let's think of, all right, I mean, you can think of things like, let's say that I have an all-you-can-eat Italian restaurant. And you've been in that restaurant now for one hour eating nothing but lasagna. And you've had seven plates of lasagna. Now, the marginal cost at this all-you-can-eat restaurant of an additional plate of lasagna, well, you're not paying anything for that extra plate, but you do have to get up, right, and you have to um, go to the counter to get another thing of another plate of lasagna so you you'll spend some time you know standing up and, and getting it and then sitting back down so the cost is very minimal but the benefit is even less actually right you're almost about to to vomit from having eaten so much lasagna and i'm sorry now that i've ruined your meal but the benefit is so low that you're probably not going to eat that seventh plate of lasagna that would explain why you don't do it in that case Every decision I make should be comparing these benefits and costs. Now, what economists then do is they use the scientific method. And the scientific method is spelled out for you here. If you've taken any other sort of science course, you're well aware of this. But essentially, I observe a certain set of events occurring, and then I try to come up with some explanation for... <coughs> why things are the way that they are. And then I find a way to test that explanation. Based on my results of that test, I then either accept, reject, or modify my hypothesis. And then I'll obviously continue to test that hypothesis as time goes on. Any economic concepts that you are going to learn in this next six weeks and overall Economists do use assumptions quite a bit. They generalize quite a bit. They also employ this assumption of other things being equal so that we can isolate certain things going on. This other things equal assumption, you'll see it sometimes called ceteris paribus. So that would be Latin uh, for all of the things being equal so that I can try to explain how a certain thing, how a certain end outcome can change based on just changing one thing, well, I would need to hold all the other things constant to show a relationship between two certain variables. And economists do use lots of graphs. Um, you will be forced to graph in this course, and you'll see me drawing graphs as this course proceeds. As I identified here, in this course, there's both microeconomics and macroeconomics. Again, if you're going to be taking more econ, this would be EC 130 here at the UH system. This would be EC 131. Well, what we're doing in this course is we're combining both of them. Your eye should be drawn to that initial part here in each of these cases the micro part and the macro part. Micro is dealing with individual decision units. That would mean households or just single individuals and firms. In macroeconomics, I'm looking at the economy as a whole. And uh, basically in the second part of this course, we're going to be looking at this. In the third part of this course, we're going to be looking at this. So the first part is going to be basically more of how do economists think of the world in general. Second part of this course, and then third part of this course. So let's then look at um, how an individual makes... Um, like, how can we think of how what their economic decision is? Well, one of the biggest things that limits what people do is the fact that they have limited income. They only have so much income to do the things that they want to do. But they have a lot of wants that they have to satisfy with that limited income. So one thing that economists can think about is then 
creating a budget line. And what that budget line would differentiate between or separate is those things that I can afford and those things that I cannot afford. So instead of seeing the words attainable and unattainable, you could also think of it as affordable and unaffordable. Obviously, when I decide to buy something, that means that's less of the other thing that I can buy. So if I buy a $100,000 car, that means I'm probably going to be eating ramen noodles for the next <laughs> decade, right? I made a trade-off. I have said I am going to have to live on ramen noodles. I'm talking the cheap kind, like the 25-cent kind, 20-cent kind, right? I'm going to have to eat really bad ramen because I decided to buy a really fancy car. Well, that's my trade-off. That's my opportunity cost. Now, in the way that I've just said that, right, buying a $100,000 car versus buying ramen noodles, I've told you I personally wouldn't make that same decision. Now, I'm not implying that everyone else is going to make that same kind of decision. But in my case, I wouldn't make that decision. The trade-offs are too large. I like things other than ramen noodles. <coughs> now, that budget line then that's showing me the difference between affordable and unaffordable, we can obviously shift that line if I have more income. So then the question becomes then, how does this all look? It looks something like this. So this would be called a budget line or a budget constraint. And in that budget line or budget constraint, what we can then do is say, give me a total income. So in this case, the person is presumed to have $120. And then what I have here are two different products, DVDs and paperback books. Now, what is this person, a fossil who buys DVDs and books anymore? Uh, well, anyway, um, again, these are the publishers. I'm just using them as the thing to work with here. The price of DVDs is given as $20. The price of books, so P subscript books, is given as $10. So if I wanted to start to create this, so instead of seeing this end product here, let's start to draw this out this way. So you can see how that was created. Income equaling $120. Um, DVDs is $20. Books on the x axis here. I'm going to have quantity of books, Q of books. On the y axis here, I'm going to have quantity of DVDs. Well, if I spent all of my income on DVDs, the question would be is how many could I buy? The answer is six, right? Which would be, well, how did I get that? That would be the total income of $120 divided by the price of the actual product, $20. 120 divided by 20 is equal to six. That's my one intercept. So I have total income divided by the price of that product. On the book side, total income, $120, divided by the price of books, $10. That's equal to 12. And then all I simply do is connect the dots. And presumably that would have been a straight line, which means that I really bothered those of you who are um, like to use a ruler when you draw lines. I don't, so I'm sorry if I've offended you in some way. Um, this line is straight. It's a straight line because what's really cool about this is that this line is telling me the trade-off. It's a constant trade-off. What's the trade-off?
if I gave you 20 bucks, you could either buy two books or one DVD. Every time you buy a DVD, you are sacrificing getting two books. Every time you get two books, you are sacrificing one DVD. That's the trade-off there, reflected by those relative prices to each other. Let's go back to this. Within that budget constraint, we then have the two regions. Those things that we cannot afford, unattainable or, I would add, unaffordable. And those that exist below the line, those that are attainable or affordable. Now, if I existed anywhere below that line, I would obviously have some money saved over. If I'm operating on the line, then I'm spending all of my income. I can't operate outside of the line, or if I am, I'm borrowing money from someone else, which means I'm spending beyond my budget. Now, how does this look? Well, just out of curiosity then, you can see, and this is just the um, picture from the book, but the idea is that in the U.S., if you can't see um, these numbers here, <coughs> excuse me, I hope that to your computer you said, God bless you, or something. Um, $46,000 is about the average income in the United States per capita. That means per individual um, as of 2009, so it's a little bit dated here. But that would mean that we have a lot of income that we're able to spend. Contrast that to Liberia, where the average person is making 50 cents a day or about $160 a year. That's quite a difference. And obviously that trade-off then that they're making looks quite different, right? For someone in Liberia, the issue is not do I decide to go out to eat or do I make food at home, it's do I eat in general. So when we're talking about then the resources that individuals um, are using to either buy their goods or to um, what they're using to make goods or to consume goods. We're talking about four key things that are used to make any goods in a society. And that would be land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability. Land, that would be not only physical land, but the resources that are under the land or on top of the land. So water, minerals, um, oxygen, anything on the earth, below the earth, on top of the earth, that's all land. Labor would be workers, essentially. How much work is put in. Capital. Capital refers to um, basically machines, um, technology, buildings. So capital here is not like an investment or anything like that, but it's basically um, buildings, machines, uh, to some extent, uh, technology, and then entrepreneurial ability, which is really just a fancy way of saying what is your ability to combine those things to make something else, right? Entrepreneurs are individuals that find unique and interesting ways to make something that we haven't previously considered. What are those individuals doing? They are taking risks, right? We could think of individuals like Elon Musk. We could think of individuals like Steve Jobs. But you could also think of individuals like Henry Ford. Or you could think of individuals like um, Alexander Graham Bell. Individuals who take risks, take an initiative, and they find new ways to put together labor, land, and um, capital to make products. For an economy as a whole, when we're thinking about how those decisions are made, what we t what economists tend to use is a production possibilities model. You'll sometimes hear me refer to it as a PPF, a production possibilities frontier. 
What it does is it says, given all these resources, the land, the labor, the capital, and the entrepreneurial spirit, using those kinds of things of what do we have in this economy, how much of the two how much of two certain goods could I make? So in other words, if I then just took the same two goods that we just looked at, quantity of DVDs, quantity of books, now I'm not talking about my ability as an individual to afford them, but rather I'm talking about a society's ability to produce them. Because DVDs obviously take things like plastic. They also take people having ideas about things. They take paper, right, for the liner. They take fuel to distribute them. They take labor to produce them and to sell them. Books obviously use lots of paper, use ink, etc. So now I'm going to have, let's say I'm going to have X amount of labor. Y amount of land. Z amount of capital. And A amount of entrepreneurial spirit. So I have certain amounts of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial spirit that I then say, if I devoted all of these things just to making DVDs, maybe I would make that much. And if I devoted all of my attention, all of my resources and whatnot to just making books, maybe I would make that amount. And then the question becomes, well then, do I just connect the dots? Well, not necessarily. Because I don't know what the trade-off is between DVDs and books. Right, in that model that we looked at previously, right, in this one here, Excuse me. When we looked at this one here, I connected the dots, and this was presumably a straight line because the trade off was constant. It was always two books for one DVD. We wouldn't necessarily think that that's the case, though, here. The trade off could be constant. It could be that always to make one DVD, I could have alternatively produced, let's say, five books. That the resources needed to make a DVD is that it takes so many resources that I have to make five less books. I could move along this production possibilities frontier model and make a choice that if I wanted to go to point A rather than point B, if I wanted to go to B, I have to give up books to get more DVDs. And here I've drawn it as a constant trade-off. But we don't necessarily have to think that that's always the case. Because you'll see is that I can alternatively draw it out bowed outwards. Or alternatively, it can be bowed inwards. And we'll talk about why that's the case. But this one's called a linear production possibilities frontier. This one's called an increasing. And this one's called a decreasing. <clears throat> but the slope of this line which in this case is constant, in this case is decreasing as I go from left to right, or in this case the slope is increasing as I go from left to right, right, that I can approximate a slope by kind of drawing a line of tangency. This one's called increasing because over here this line of tangency is flatter than it is way out here, right, where it's really, really steep, that line of tangency. That would mean it's increasing. What is So the slope is increasing. The name for the slope is the opportunity cost. What I've given up to make something. When I make one DVD, I give up five books. I always give up five books when I make one more DVD. 
that slope or opportunity cost is constant or linear. Here, the trade-off is getting less and less as I make more books. Here, the slope is getting increasing, or the opportunity cost is increasing as I make more books. So we could plot this out. Right? And in this case here, we could say that um, this one does not have a constant slope. To make one pizza, I give up one robot. But now, to make one more pizza, I give up two robots. And then to get one more pizza, to go from two to three, now I have to give up three robots. So to go from 0 to 1, I go from 10 to 9. That means that it's one pizza at this point between A to B. One pizza, one robot. Here, it's one pizza for two robots. Here, one pizza for three robots. Right, the difference between 7 and 4 being 3. And then for one pizza, four robots. What's happening to the opportunity cost of pizzas? It's increasing from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. Meaning, it's going to start to be plotted out like this. That I'm giving up more and more robots to make pizza. Or I could look at this fancy line that looks like this. They call it a PPC, Production Possibilities Curve. I learned it as PPF when I learned it long ago. Choose what you want to do here. Um, but this has quantity of robots, quantity of pizzas, and this is a bowed outward or increasing opportunity cost production possibilities frontier. Any of the points on the frontier are what I could produce give, with my given resources. I could obviously produce anything within the frontier. I just have some resources left over. I cannot make anything outside of the frontier uh, because I would not have the production capabilities to do that. Usually, it is the case that most of the time when you see a production possibilities frontier, it will most of the time be bowed outwards. And that's because of this, what's called the law of increasing opportunity costs. Most of the time, as we make something, we become less and less efficient at making it. Um, let me give you an example of why this is the case. Um, what if we decided to do nothing but play, you know, ukuleles, um, and every resident of Hawaii had to play an ukulele? You know, honestly, I have not played an instrument since the third grade when I had a recorder. So, at some point, they're going to say, "Shiting, you have to start playing the ukulele." I'm going to be like, "Geez, I can't even keep a tune, right? I don't even know the difference between like certain tones." right? Or what if I had some, like, disease that, like, limited my hearing, right? Or what if I had, like, no hands and I couldn't play it, right? I'd have to play it with my feet or with my nose or something, right? We can think of, if I wanted to do nothing but have ukulele playing residents in Hawaii, I would have to start to use individuals who have no business playing ukuleles, right? Like me, right? Not having any musical abilities, I should not be playing it. At that point, you're giving up a pretty productive member of society. Myself, right? Giving up lots of economics lectures, um, right? You're giving up, uh, I'm really good, uh, what else am I really good at? Uh, I'm good at driving long distances, but the distances here in, in Hawaii are obviously much less. But um, you're giving up things, really big things, a lot of production of economics lectures to get very, 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 very few ukulele playing moments.
that's what happens. As I want to, in this case, we'd be saying quantity of ukuleles being played. Now I'm talking about quantity of economic lectures. One of you in this class is probably really good at playing the ukulele. You would be not that good in delivering an economics lecture, which means I'm going to get a lot of run. I'm going to get a lot of ukuleles being played with very, 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 very little loss in lectures because you couldn't do it, right? Or you could fake it, maybe. On the other end of the extreme, I've just revealed to you I cannot play the ukulele very, very well. So that means there's very, very little ukulele playing that's going to occur with me. But you're going to give up a lot of lectures. That's why most production possibility frontiers are like this, because people are different. Resources are different. Um, capital is different. Buildings are different. They meet, they allow us to do certain things differently. Resources are not all the same. So most of the time, that land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial spirit that we were looking at is going to meet production possibility frontiers differently in the production of certain goods. Now, let's look at this other idea. Besides the opportunity cost, let's look at the optimal allocations. This was my idea that when people make a decision, what they do is they want the marginal benefits to be equal to the marginal costs. That's how I'll decide how much to do something. How much pizza, for instance, to eat. At one piece of pizza, the marginal benefit is equal to 15. That would be like in units of utility or satisfaction. I know it kind of doesn't make any sense to say I have 15 units of satisfaction, but think of it as it's a big number. Now the cost of having that, the cost, both in terms of like how much does it cost to buy it, but also the time it takes to eat it, and obviously I'm going to die a little faster by eating pizza, that's five. The marginal benefits are greater than the marginal costs. And if I told you that that was the case for unit one, the first piece of pizza, then my question to you is, do you eat a second piece of pizza? The answer is yes when it looks like that. You would get more benefit to eating, total benefit to eating an additional piece of pizza. You'll notice that at two, They're the same, the 10 and 10. The benefits and costs are the same. At unit of pizza 3, the marginal benefits are now equal to 5. And the marginal costs are equal to 15. The marginal benefits are less than the marginal costs. This person has eaten too much pizza. They should reduce how much they eat. So I don't have to tell people how much to do things. I don't have to tell people you must eat two pieces of pizza. Rather, what economists are kind of presuming here is that people can make these decisions by comparing the benefits they get to eating one more piece of pizza to the cost to eating one more piece of pizza. If the benefits are greater than the cost, they're going to do it more. Right? And if they're doing something too much, they should do it less because in, in that case the benefits are less than the cost. Now, why do economists call addictions irrational? Right? Like, um, you know, decades ago I smoked. I loved smoking. I still miss it. But smoking was irrational. The benefits were certainly far less than the cost I was doing to myself, right? The 
prices I was paying for cigarettes, it's rational to not smoke at all, right? Or maybe just be able to smoke one so you look a little cool, right, and, and whatnot. But I'm not encouraging smoking. It's really bad. Don't do it. Um, but that's what we call addictions. Uh, that's why people who don't have addictions to things can't understand why, for instance, an alcoholic just can't put the liquor bottle down or why a smoker can't just decide I shouldn't smoke anymore. Right? It doesn't make sense to us because we're making that kind of, we're making this kind of understanding here. But the addictive person, right, for whatever reason, isn't making these kinds of decisions. They're not acting rationally. You know, it could be any number of things that causes a person to be addicted to certain things, um, right? Psychological, genetic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, the environment that they're surrounded in that could stop them from making these kinds of calculations. Or at least an economist, in a heartless kind of way, can say addictions don't make any sense. Now, when we're talking about um, how, with that production possibility frontiers, how it looks. Unemployment represents a worker who exists who's not actually producing. Unemployment would represent that I exist at a point inside of the production possibilities frontier. If I get someone who is you know, physically able to work, if I find them a job, instead of watching Judge Judy on TV, they're now going to start making books. Or they're going to start making DVDs. Or they're going to work at Borders and sell DVDs and books. But whatever they're doing, now that they are working, I'm going to start moving closer to the frontier. As for growth, I can also shift out my frontier. I can shift out my frontier if I get more people, if I get more, if I take over another country, if I get more capital, if people become more entrepreneurial. All these things can shift out a frontier and allow the country to consume more. And that's what you see right here. The way that you grow an economy. For instance, um, if you look at what economists believe on certain issues, I mean, regardless of your views of, let's say, immigration, right? Immigration means allowing people that don't live in your country to come and get a job and live in your country and work in your country. Economists in general, in general, might be in favor of bringing in workers from foreign countries because what that would represent is a PPF or a PPC, however you want to think of it, would represent a frontier shifting outwards. Or, right, um, technology has gotten better, right? Computers are more reliable, they last longer, that could help in an improving economy. Uh, resource quality can also improve, right? As water becomes cleaner, as air becomes cleaner, you and I are all healthier, right? As you and I you're in class right now, obviously, you're learning more, you're going to become a more productive worker. Well, you're a better worker than you used to be because you now have had Econ 120 as a class, as an example. <clears throat> and what that can mean then if I plot this out is that I can shift out my production possibilities frontier. Or in other words, A growing economy, that means either I have essentially more resources or better resources, that helps an economy grow. So ideally, not only do I want to bring in immigrants, but I want to bring in maybe college-educated immigrants, right? That's going to allow my economy to really grow, as an example.
And what we then look at here as we as we bring this all together then is um, a way to then think about how um, what we face right now is a decision of what do we decide to do in the present and in the future. If I decide to consume more goods in the present, that means I don't save that much money. And as a result, I can't make long-term investments on... Right? You're in school right now. That means you either saved a lot of money or you're borrowing money to do that, probably. That means you are foregoing some current consumption so that you can invest in your future. You actually look a little bit more like this. So you're consuming less now so that you can right, save things for the future. But the result is that what you're really hoping right, is that you're going to make more money. And this curve is shifted out further than one who decides to just drink at the bars all night and decide to focus on the present rather than the future. Right? This is the reason why we could say college graduates make more money um, after graduation. Right? Because they've invested in their future and their production um, frontier as an individual even exists further out, in the f um, further out than someone who focuses on the present. Now, um, at this point, um, we've got the appendix. And I'm a little uncertain of how much time I want to spend on this um, because you all have different mathematical abilities. Uh, and there is a, um, you know, we can think of the prerequisite that exists for this course. What I'm going to say for this, at least, is... Um, I'm going to stop the lecture here at least so that we can focus on one. In terms of the appendix, if you are comfortable with graphs, you probably won't need to look at it at all. Um, uh, yeah, um, if you're comfortable with graphs, this shouldn't probably impose any problems. If you want, you can read the appendix, um, and you can read these slides. I'll just keep this lecture rather short, though. Um, but all these are things that we will um, um, talk about in greater detail as the um, course proceeds. But in terms of the appendix, you'll, you know that you need to look at it if you're not as comfortable with math as, as you should be. But a lot of it is really just kind of like... Um, high school mathematics or um, that kind of thing. Okay, so that kind of concludes chapter one here. I mean, you are responsible still for the appendix, but if you're comfortable with math, you shouldn't have any issues. But that basically concludes then this um, first chapter um, for this course.